Well, a pleasant good morning to uh, all of you. It is a um, again a pleasure for me to come before you and to uh, worship with you. Um, thank you, Brother Derek, for those songs and leading us, and uh, for everyone who has participated in the in the worship so far. It is again always good when we can come together and worship God together and uh, sing praises to him and pray to him and be united as a family of God's children. Uh, as I said when I was last here, this is the greatest kingdom known to man because in this kingdom we're all one. No matter what we look like, where we come from, no matter our economic status, in Christ we are all one and that is truly a blessing. Uh, that God has given us, and to anyone who would desire to become a child of God, God is willing and able and yearning to have you to be his child, and that's such a great blessing. As was mentioned before, we're going to be looking at some verses here in Ecclesiastes. I started uh, teaching in this book or preaching lessons from this book, uh, over at Almaden uh, Valley. And this is a wonderful book. If you have read it, you see the wisdom displayed in it. Uh, if you haven't read it, it would be really worth your time to read it. Um, now, even though the author doesn't give his name, uh, it is believed by many, including myself, that this is Solomon, the son of David. And there's a reason why I believe that he is. He calls himself the son of David, king in Jerusalem. The Hebrew word for preacher is Kohalath, and this is like the preacher's sermon. This is like Solomon's sermon. Uh, there is a lot that is covered in this book, uh, but it is, it is from a, a standpoint, a, a worldview of someone who doesn't have God in their life and how they view life. And so he begins the book of Ecclesiastes by saying, vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. And that's not a good way to begin a sermon when you are talking about life. But again, it is written and it is from a worldview of someone who doesn't have a relationship with God. And when you don't have a relationship with God, when you don't know God, then everything is vain. Everything is vanity. No matter what you may have in this world, without God, you're not truly going to appreciate life. And I think that was, that was Solomon's point. I, I think that is not that Solomon is writing from it from his perspective, but it is from a worldly perspective. He certainly... Uh, uh, experience the, um, all of the pleasures of life, if you will, because of his riches. He had great wisdom. And in the book, he talks about the pressure that comes with wisdom. The more you know, the more stress comes with knowing everything that, that there is to know. But at the end of the book, he tells us that really the whole purpose of man it's to fear God and keep his commandments. It's not about how much money you can keep and how good your portfolio looks. But at the end of it, this man says, the best thing that you can do is to fear God and keep his commandments. Now, as the brother read for us in the Bible reading, and I like the version that he read from because it's very plain uh, and down to earth, and I like that renditioning that he, uh, that, that translation that he used. But in Ecclesiastes in verse four, he says, a generation comes and a generation goes, but the earth remains forever. Also the sun rises and the sun sets and hastening to its place, it rises there again, blowing toward the south and turning toward the north, the wind continues swirling along. And on its circular courses, the wind returns. All the rivers flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. What Solomon is describing is what we will call the circle of life. And I believe the brother's translation 
talked about that, right? And it reminds me of the, the Lion King cartoon, right? When uh, uh, Mufasa is with his son Simba and he takes him out and he tells him about the circle of life. Everything has a, a time and a place and things are going to die and things are going to be born. And that's, that's a, uh, a, a view, uh, a humanistic point of view when it comes to the world. Black Elk, who was a religious leader for the Sioux tribe, who later became a Roman Catholic, said this, everything an Indian does is in a circle. Even the seasons form a great circle and they're changing and always come back to where they were. The life of a man is a cycle from childhood to childhood. And that's basically what he's saying is that life is just one big circle. You, you are born, you grow, you get old and you die. And the next child that comes along, it's the same thing. That it's really no different, that we're all basically the same. Well, is that really true? Well, I don't think it is. While death is a great equalizer to us all, our lives aren't the same. We all, each of us in this room, we all have a unique experience in life. The way you were born, where you were born, who you were born to, where you were raised, all of those things, not, none of us are the same. And so even though we have the same cycle, our lives are completely different and unique in its own. We all have different stories of how we came to a knowledge of Christ and how we were baptized. But for centuries, Wise men and women from different natures and cultures have been pondering the mysteries of the circle of life. So whenever we use phrases like life circle or everything comes full circle, then we are joining with Solomon and others in a uh, cyclical view of life. And this view of life was a burden to Solomon. And the question is, why? Why was it a burden to him? Well, if life is only part of a great circle over which we have no control, then is life really worth living? If life repeats itself over and over again, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, then why are we unable to explain it? If it's the same thing, Scientists are baffled. How do you explain the way life works? Well, Solomon thought about these questions. And he came to these rather bleak conclusions. In the verses that we just read in verses 4 through 7, he says nothing changes. And then in verses 8 through 11, he says nothing is new. And then he concludes the chapter in verses 12 through 18 by saying, Nothing can be understood. Well, that's bleak. And so in the first part, which is what we will spend our time with this, e this morning, Solomon focuses on the elements of nature. He begins with the earth, the sun, wind, and water. And he is amazed that while generations of people came and went, the cycle of nature remained the same. There was change all around, but nothing really changed. Everything was only a part of the wheel of nature. And that led to the monotony of life. And so Solomon presents, as I said, four pieces of evidence to prove that nothing changes. He begins with the earth in verse four. He says, a generation comes and goes, but the earth remains forever. Now, from a human perspective, beloved, nothing is more permanent and durable than the planet on which we live. With all of its diversity, nature is uniform enough in its operation that we can discover its laws and put them to work for us. Right? We know about the law of gravity, and because we know about the law of gravity, we're able to use that to sustain our existence. And so we use different types of things in nature 
to sustain our lives. It is this dependability that is the basis for modern, modern science. Nature is permanent, Solomon is telling us, but man is not. We are only pilgrims on earth, and our pilgrimage is a very brief one. And then death comes and claims us all. Solomon, throughout this book, speaks on the brevity of life and the certainty of death. As I said just a few moments ago, that's the great equalizer of all humans. All of mankind, we are all equal in that we're going to die. Doesn't matter what you try to do, you cannot escape death. Death comes for everyone. Life is indeed brief. Individuals come and go. Nations and empires rise and fall. But nothing changes because the earth remains the same. When you think of biblical history, right? You have the Israelites that were a great nation. Then you had Assyrian, Babylonian. You had the Roman Empire. You had the British Empire. You had all these empires that God, as he sits in eternity, sees, comes. Well, kings and queens come, rise and fall. But the earth remains the same. Thomas uh, Carlyle said this about history. History is a mighty drama enacted upon the theater of time with suns for lamps and eternity for her background. Life, he said, and history is just a drama that, that is played out. And it is played out under the, under the, the heavens. But nothing really changes. Well, from the earth, Solomon then focuses on the sun. In verse 5, he says also, the sun rises and the sun sets and hastens to its place. It, there it rises again. Solomon moves then from the circle of uh, birth and death to the circle of day and night in the heavens. As sure as the world is replaced by as certain as night follows day. And so Solomon pictures the sun rising in the east and painting. And if you have uh, uh, your Bible translations, depending on what it is, you'll see a little footnote. And it basically means uh, painting. That's the literal translation. So Solomon says he watches the sun rise from the east and it paints its way across the sky. But the sun has a destination, folks, and it's it's headed west. And so it paints the sky in pursuit of the western horizon. But the question that Solomon asks is this, what does it accomplish by its daily journey? The sun comes up and it paints the sky and then it goes west and it sets. What is the purpose of the sun's motion and heat? As far as the heavens are concerned, Solomon says, one day is just like another. Wake up and the sun does the same thing all the time. And nothing really changes. It's just the same. Then Solomon turns to the wind. And he says, the wind continues swirling along. And in its circular courses, the wind returns. So while the east to west movement of the sun is clearly visible because it paints the sky, Solomon says the north and south movement of the wind is not. You can't see the wind. Now Solomon is not giving us a lecture, if you will, on the physics of wind. But what Solomon is stating is that the wind is in constant motion and that man cannot fully understand it or fully chart it. 
Weathermen can chart the weather, but you can't chart the wind. And this reminds me of what Jesus said in John chapter 3. You guys are familiar with this, right? When he speaks to Nicodemus the Pharisee. And Nicodemus comes to him at night. And Nicodemus says, I believe that you are the son of God because no man can do what you do unless God sent him. And Jesus says, well, unless a man is born again of water and the spirit, he can't see the kingdom of heaven. And so Nicodemus says, well, how can a man be born again? Do I need to go back into my mother's womb? And so Jesus, in having this discourse, said to him, truly, I truly, I say to you, that which is born of flesh is of flesh, and that which is born of spirit is, is of spirit. So do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. What Jesus is saying is, you cannot see the kingdom, but you can feel the influence of it. Because it's everywhere. You see, in the, in the days that Jesus wrote this, in the days that Jesus walked the earth, excuse me, it was a place of worship where the Jews went. You all know where it is? Jerusalem. It's where the temple was. And so that was the primary place of worship. In Acts 1, that's where the Jews go, right? They go there uh, to, to celebrate the Passover, right? That's where the temple was. That was the place of worship for Jerusalem. Jews knew that was the central place. Well, when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, the woman asked him the question, right? Where do we worship? The, your people say you worship here. My people say we worship on Mount Gerizim. And Jesus tells the woman, a time is coming when you will neither worship here nor there. What Jesus was talking about is the influence of the kingdom. There will come a time when you don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship because the influence of the kingdom will spread throughout the world. You're not going to see it, but you're going to feel it. And that's why Jesus likens it to the wind. You can't see the wind, but you can feel it. The wind is constantly moving and it is constantly changing directions, but it's still the wind. It's been that way since the world was created. It's been that way before we walked the earth. This is a tornado that hit Oklahoma a few years back. This is what the wind does. We live in a very unique country because just about anywhere you go, you're going to deal with a natural disaster. When you're out west, what do you all have to deal with? Earthquakes. You go in the middle of the state, what do you have to deal with? Tornadoes. You go out south, down south, where I live, what do you have to deal with? Hurricanes. If you say, well, hey, I'll go up north and escape it, guess what's coming? Nor'easters. Everywhere in this country, we are surrounded by natural disasters. And that's what the wind does. Powerful. It can be calm, and then the wind can be so strong that it can devastate communities. But it is, at the end of the day, it's still the wind. Nothing really changes. So we hear it and feel it. We can see the destruction and the things that it does. But the wind is still the same. And Solomon says it goes on forever. And then in verse 7, Solomon then turns to the rivers. He says, the rivers... Flow into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, there they flow again. And so in this verse, Solomon is describing the water cycle that helped sustain life on our planet. According to the United States Geological Survey, 97% of Earth's water is found in the oceans 
and only 0.0001% is in the atmosphere available for rain. That's enough for 10 days worth of rain. How could you deny God, folks? Do you see how perfect God created things? That little bit amount of water can sustain us for 10 days. Not only that, but the corporation of the sun and the wind makes evaporation possible, as well as the movement of moisture. And so this keeps water circulating. Now that's a unique thing, folks. And Solomon, as he's looking at that, says, even with all of that, even with the cycle of water and the evaporation process, he says, the sea never changes. The river and the rains pour water into the seas, but the seas remain the same. And so whether we look at the heavens, the earth, the winds or waters, we come to the same conclusion. Nature does not change. So is it any wonder then that Solomon cites the monotony of life? Well, Brother Derek, that's a really pessimistic sermon. Well, nothing changes. Everything is the same. Every day is the same. The sun just paints the sky and then it sets. And the seeds remain the same. That's, that's really pessimistic. That's a pessimistic view of life. And I think that was Solomon's point. I think Solomon is pointing to something greater. And it would be pessimistic if we looked at life under the sun and left God out of it. If this world is a closed system that is uniform, predictable, and unchangeable. Then there is motion, but there's no promotion. It becomes a world where no prayers are answered. It becomes a world where nothing can interrupt the cycle of nature. And if there is a God in this kind of world, then he cannot act on our behalf because he will be imprisoned within the laws of nature that cannot be suspended. If we had a cynical worldview, if we looked at life just as life under the sun, then that's how God would operate. Then God would, would, would have to operate the way we operate. But beloved, I have good news. This is our Father's world. And because this is our Father's world, he breaks through nature and he does wonderful things. He is a God who hears our prayers and then works on behalf of his people. And I'm going to show you in the Bible how God broke through nature and acted in saving his people. We're going to begin in Joshua 10. Now in Joshua chapter 9, as God's people are moving through Canaan, God had given his people a direct command. And that is when they went into Canaan, they were to kill the inhabitants of that land. And God told them, if you don't do it, they will take you away from me. Well, there was a group of people in Canaan known as the Gibeonites. And when they see Joshua and his people moving, they see the destruction that is coming. And so they disguise themselves as foreigners. And so they, they put on old clothes. They put old wineskins in and they even use old bread. And so when they come to the Israelites, they tell them we came from a foreign land and we need rest. Please let us stay in the land. And in chapter 9, the people did something that they should not have done. They did not consult God. 
and young people and all people alike, before you make any decision, consult God, pray to him. They didn't do that. And they believed the Gibeonites. And because they believed the Gibeonites, they made a promise and went into a, a covenant with them that they will protect them. Well, in chapter 10, five kings from different nations are going to war with the Gibeonites. And so the Gibeonites come knocking. And they said, hey, remember that covenant you made? Well, now enemies are coming and you have to protect us. Well, now we go to Joshua 10 and verse 6. The men of Gibeon sent word to Joshua to the camp of Gilgal saying, do not abandon your servants, but come to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that live in the hill country have assembled against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war, with all the valiant warriors. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not one of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly by marching all night around Gilgal. And the Lord confounded them before Israel, and he slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and pursued them by the way of the ascent of Beth Haran, and struck them as far as Azekah and Mechadiah. And they fled from Israel while they were in the descent of Beth Haran. The Lord threw large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There, uh, there were no more who died from the hailstones than those who the sons of Israel killed with the sword. Do you see what God did there? God said, don't fear them. I'll take care of it. And God caused hailstones to fall and kill all of them. Now you put yourself as a soldier in the Israelite army and you hear God uh, say, don't fear them. I will take care of it. And you watch as hail just falls from the sky and only kills them. That's powerful. But God doesn't stop there, folks. In verse 12, then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day, and the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, and O moon in the valley of Ahijlon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves from their enemies. You say the earth remains the same. God says, watch this. I will cause the sun to stop so that you can kill your enemies. And when God said it, the sun stopped. Exodus 14. You all being good Bible students, you know what this chapter is about. When God divides the Red Sea. John, Moses comes before the people. In Exodus 14 and verse 13. Do not fear, Moses tells them. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which, will, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. It takes a lot of confidence to say that statement, but God was with him. So you put yourself in these Israelites' uh, shoes. You have been beaten and mistreated, mistreated by the Israelites. And then this 80-year-old man comes with his brother. And he says to them, to, to Pharaoh, let my people go. And he refuses. He refuses 10 times. And God bends nature 10 times, but his heart is still hardened. And so he lets them go, but then he chases them. You have no weapons, you have no armor, but here comes this mighty Egyptian army. And this 80 year old man stands up and says, God is about to do something wonderful for you. You don't, you, you have doubt, even though you've seen the 10 plagues, here is what God is gonna do for you. So then we come down to verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord swept the sea back by the strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land. So the waters 
were divided. And the sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on dry land, and the waters were like a wall on their right hand and on their left. Not only, folks, did God divide the Red Sea, but the land that they walked on was completely dry. The sea remains the same. God says, I beg to differ. That is what the Lord can do. Not only frozen. It's all good. We don't need that. <clears throat> Not only can he divide the Red Sea, but in Isaiah 38, Isaiah 38, we have the story of Hezekiah. There it is. We have the story of Hezekiah. And you're familiar with King Hezekiah because in the days of Hezekiah, he became mortally ill. And Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, came and said to him, thus says the Lord your God, set your house in order. You shall die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Hezekiah was a king of Judah. And he says, Lord, I beseech you. How I have walked before you in truth and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah saying, go and say to Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of your father, David, I have heard your prayers. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will add 15 years to your life. There's no doctor in this world that can do that. There's nobody on the face of the earth that can walk up to you and say, Jennifer Lewis, I will add 20 years to you. Mom, I'm your son. I can't do it. Your precious grandkids can't do it. God can. He heard this man's prayers and he said, I'm going to add 15 years to your life. But here's why, here's why one of the many reasons why I love God. God does things for us that he doesn't have to do. He didn't have to add 15 years, but he adds 15 years, right? And you would think, okay, we'll move on. Well, God is going to do more for Hezekiah. He says, I will deliver you in this city from the hands of the king uh, of Assyria, and I will defend the city. This shall be a sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing as he has spoken. Behold, I will cause the shadow of the stairway, which has gone down with the sun on the stairway of Ahaz, to go back 10 steps. So the sun's shadow went back 10 steps on the stairway of which it had gone. Uh, Solomon says, the sun remains the same. And God says, I will move the sun back. If y'all can tell me somebody else other than God who can do it. I'll be standing back there. God just said it. Do you understand how amazing that is? He said it, and the sun moved back. He said, sun, move back, and the sun moved back. He told the sun, stand still, and the moon, stand still, and they did it. In James chapter 5, James chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it will not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. This is when Elijah goes up and he faces off against the uh, prophets of Baal. And when, the, when God is successful, he tells Ahab, you are going to have a drought. God is going to bring a drought to you. And for three years, it didn't rain. Then James says, he prayed again in verse 18. And the sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. After three years, uh, Elijah goes into this brook. And he's, he's hidden in the brook. And God says, a storm is coming. God was being literal and metaphorical because a storm 
was coming for Ahab and Jezebel. But Elijah tells his servant, look to the east and tell me what's coming. And he says, master, I see clouds forming. And he says, go tell Ahab a storm's coming. Only God can do that. Years ago, y'all are going through a, a drought now. But I remember there was another drought when I was here, living here. And there were some Baptists who were getting a day because of the drought. They were going to have a prayer meeting. And it was suggested at a church of Christ that, hey, somebody heard it. They heard what these Baptists were doing, and they had suggested it to a church of Christ. And the elder said, no, we can't do what the Baptists are doing. You see how foolish that is? When there's a drought, who's going to fix it? You think Gavin Newsom's going to fix it? You think the president is, you think they have the tools to fix it? Only God can fix it. And that's who the Baptists turned to. We may disagree, but that was the right thing they did. You got a drought. Who is going to end the drought? God. Who do you seek? God. But these elders acted so foolishly because the Baptists did it. Well, we can do it. Then what's your purpose, friend? What's your purpose? There is a drought in California right now. We had rain a few weeks ago, but it wasn't a lot. Who's going to fix it? Turn to God. Pray to him. James says, Elijah was a man just like you. Why do you think the Holy Spirit wrote it? Why do you think the Holy Spirit gave him the wisdom to write it, I should say? It's because God is going to tell us, Elijah was just like you. There was nothing special about Elijah. He wasn't some, some alien from another planet. He was a man just like you who believed in God. Pray to him. Because this is his world. In Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Beginning in verse 35. On that day when evening came, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there was a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on a cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and became perfectly calm. Now, folks, here it is in this boat. And it's not some luxury liner. It's a boat similar to this portrait you see. And it's being filled up with water. And we can get on the disciples, but we would be just like, I know I would. Lord, you're sleeping, can't you see? And all Jesus did. Peace be still. And what happened? Peace. Can I go to bed now? Who else can do that but God? If Jesus can calm and, and stop the fury of nature, what can he do to your life? And one day, God will destroy all of the forces of nature. Second, three, second Peter 3 and verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burnt up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and goodness? One day, this place is all going to be destroyed. This country has a lot of marvelous sites. There's the Grand Canyon, there's Mount Rushmore, 
There's all kinds of beautiful plate, all kinds of the uh, Colorado Rockies, the Smoky Mountains. But one day, all of that will be destroyed by God. Folks, we get so concerned about things that happen on this earth that we often lose our focus. And we see things that happen and we get so bogged down by them that we forget that we serve an awesome God. And so often, instead of trusting and relying on God, we trust and rely on men who are fallible. Because we think men have all of the answers. Men do not have the answers, folks. This planet belongs to God. Now, we should take care of it. We shouldn't loot, uh, litter, and pollute it. But this planet belongs to God. God will destroy the planet. Man cannot. We cannot destroy it. And it always amazes me when politicians around, right around election time, they will tell you, well, you need to vote for me because I can stop such and such. Really? How can you stop a hurricane? Could you tell me? I'm all ears. How can you do that? How is me electing you? How is that going to stop hurricanes from coming? Can you, can you tell me? It is the hubris of man to think that we can. Now, folks, that's just one man's opinion. But we need to trust in God. Because God can move past nature and do wonderful things for his people. When God becomes our heavenly father, we no longer live in, live in a closed system of an endless, monotonous cycles. You will serve a God who will surpass all nature and meet your every need. One more verse before we close. A verse that you're all familiar with, I know, in Matthew 6. In verse 25, Jesus says, uh, the, the, head, the heading for my Bible here is the cure for anxiety. And I know that that's just a, that's how men have done it. But I always like that because this is really the cure for anxiety. Jesus says, for this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more uh, worth, are you not, are you not worth much more than they? You know, Brother Derek, I've never seen a bird wiping off and going, oh, how am I going to feed myself? Never seen a bird do that. They fly and God takes care of them. And Jesus says, you are more precious than a bird or any other animal. Excuse me, animal lovers, because you were made with a soul. Animals were not. Animals will die and they will go into the ground and they will, be, they will turn into to soil and, and help plant life grow. But you were created with a soul. You were created in the image of God. And so Jesus says, if God is going to take care of the birds, what do you think God is going to do for you? And then he continues, and who of you, by, war by uh, worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe the lilies of the field. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. Do you understand what Jesus is saying there? Solomon was the richest man of his day. And when Solomon built the temple, it was a glorious sight to the point when when the temple was destroyed and the Jews returned from captivity and they rebuilt the temple, the elders who, who uh, witnessed Solomon's temple cried. You know why? 
wasn't as beautiful as Solomon's temple. And so Jesus says, the lilies, not even Solomon was clothed like these lilies, he says. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown in the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of heaven, and all and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. Focus on today. You know why? Worrying about tomorrow is not going to do you any good. Because tomorrow is out of your control. You understand? An hour from now is out of your control. You understand me? I hope to go to uh, 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 Aki's with my mom and eat some good food. That's all dependent upon the Lord, folks. I can't sit and worry about it. Folks, I've made a lot of horrible mistakes in my life. Done a lot of horrible and dumb things. But I'm grateful I serve a God who can surpass nature and help me put my life together. I'm glad I serve a God who, even though I have done dumb things, is willing to forgive me and make me better. It's going to take a lot of time. But God has been good to me. More than I deserve. This is our Father's world. And as Christians, we live as pilgrims in this world, not prisoners. And when you live as, pril as pilgrims, you can confidently and joyfully sing, this is my Father's world. If you are not a Christian, and you want God to be your Father in His world, you can do that by being baptized for the remission of your sins, Come out of that water a new creature. Live your life in service to God. If as a Christian, you have not been living right, and you need the prayers and help of this congregation, then let us help you in any way that we can. Because we all are trying to get to the same place, and that is heaven. May God bless you. May God bless the work that you do, the elders and the deacons here. May God bless the uh, preacher when he comes and may you continue to shine as a beacon of light in this community. This community needs you because you are people of God serving him in his world. If we could help you in any way, please come as we stand and as we sing.